as I understand your work or any work that anyone does, you are only as effective as the tools you use. And if we are trying to assemble molecules, you need something that can, are they tweezers? Are they, you need some tools that are small enough to take this molecule over here and attach it to that molecule over there. And it seems like this is the RNA nanotechnology that you're referring to. Your toolkit are not mechanical tools, they're biological and chemical tools. Is that, is that a fair way to characterize what you're doing? Indeed, indeed. So we don't use tweezers on a nanoscale, <laughs> although they exist, right? That's is actually an amazing part of physics. They do exist. But um, what we do is we actually do something very similar to what a protein designer would do, right? Protein design won the Nobel Prize last year. And we do something similar, or we're trying to do something similar um, with RNA. And that's a much less explored field, indeed. Um, so RNA origami is, is quite new. But what, what, what we are essentially trying to do is we are trying to assemble a synthetic gene from scratch, a piece of DNA, which encodes for an RNA that folds up during transcription. So while the DNA is read off, it folds up into a desired structure. So that could be something that resembles a cytoskeletal element, or it could, could be something that resembles a nanopore that assembles into the lipid membrane of a cell so we can feed it, for instance. So the functionality, so the forms are really driven by the function that we would like to create. And design happens with computational tools, essentially. All right, so the folding, I'm fascinated by the folding. Absolutely, me too. As a kid, I was into origami, and I still am a little bit. I have big pudgy fingers, but I was very <laughs> delicate with the with my little birds, and the, the, uh -huh. I, I can still do it. Okay. I got like three left in my repertoire that I can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so do you know in advance how you need to fold your proteins? Because the protein itself is obviously not yet life. So you, you, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> if, if, if you don't know, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's rumored that this is what Einstein said. Research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're not targeting a life form you already know about, then how do you direct the decisions you make towards a life form that has never existed before? Mm -hmm. Well, essentially, we know what functions we need to realize, right? So we, we want, in the end, a self-replicating system, which is capable to evolve. And in order to have that, first of all, this system is, uh, needs to be able to build up its own molecular machinery, and that machinery we, we build from RNA. Um, and one piece that we think is crucial for such a machinery is actually kind of a machinery which can divide a lipid vesicle. So essentially impose a certain amount of membrane curvature on the membrane of a vesicle. And in natural cells, this happens via an architecture that is called the cytoskeleton, the skeleton of a cell. So one of the first kind of um, things that we build with RNA, uh, that we built from RNA was actually cytoskeletal uh, mimics, so to say, but all from RNA, not from pr protein. So we look at them, we look at how they look in nature, we look at how they function in nature, and we are trying to design something which looks very similar. So that could be, first of all, small building blocks that then assemble into micrometer uh, long filaments that then can, for instance, attach to the membrane so that the membrane can be deformed. And because they are genetically enco encoded, we now have actually a p quite powerful help helper, and that's evolution. So essentially, we can then start to go to the DNA level, to the DNA level again, and introduce mutations so that we can evolve the RNA structures towards even better function. Well, so you, so you are introducing your own mutations. Well, or we have biological machinery introduce them. Is that essentially yes. You're not going to wait around a billion years or a million years. You're doing it yourself. We're doing two things here. We, are, we start with a rationally engineering starting point, right? So we already know what we want to get. So we have a very simple version that already works a bit. And then we let evolution brush it, brush it up, so to say. Where does information theory fold into this? Because when we're taught DNA in school, we think of it 
less of a molecule, of course that's what it is, but as something that encodes the a biological information. And so how do you make sure that the information that's in there is the information you need? So that's where computational design really comes in, right? So we really start with, um, we, we think of what kind of, what kind of 3D architecture do we want to create from, from RNA? And then we essentially, um, design a synthetic gene, a synthetic piece of DNA, which upon transcription, so when it's read by the biological polymerase, will make an RNA that folds up on itself in a desired way, essentially. How much of the sort of design in the fold, you said it's done compute computationally. So how much of it is sort of, sort of designed computationally and how much is it you physically do it and then you see what you end up with and adjust? First we design computationally and then we physically do it. We check it in the lab with experimental techniques like cryo-electron microscopy to really visualize um, single molecules and their architecture. And then we can essentially see if the structure is entirely correct um, if or if we need to make improvements um, on the DNA sequence level in order to in order to fix certain things that we would like to look ever so slightly different. Is there a difference between you creating a life that we already know about, so synthetically creating a simple life? Because it seems to me that would be easier because you already have you know, already know exactly what you're aiming for, versus putting all this together and creating something no one has ever seen before. You'd still get a lot of credit in this world if you created a life form that already exists on Earth, just out of raw ingredients. That would still be amazing. But you, that's not good enough for you. You want something else to crawl out of the test tube. So essentially, there are a bit different branches in the field of bottom-up synthetic biology, um, which use different types of um, molecules, different types of molecular building blocks. So either the very natural ones, so really taking pieces from cells, essentially, proteins that you just encapsulate and boot, so to say, inside of a lipid vesicle. And then um, there is others who take entirely synthetic pieces. And then there is us who is somewhere in the middle. Um, and, you know, there is pros and cons to using the biological machinery. But in the end, you know, I could imagine that bottom-up synthetic biology brings about multiple examples of synthetic life, the ones that are very similar to life as we know it and ones that are quite far away. The problem with biology as we know it is that it's already extremely complex, right? So to give you an example here, right? All life on earth that we know um, adheres to the central dogma of molecular biology, which states that DNA makes RNA, RNA makes proteins. And now this machinery alone require this, this step from RNA to protein requires 150 components, 150 genes just for this step. So if we can circumvent the use of proteins and we just build a functional machinery from RNA. So we have our genotypes, uh, our genotypes stored in DNA, but we have the function in the RNA. The phenotype uh, is introduced by RNA. Then we can reduce the complexity of the system quite a lot. And, you know, life has not always been that complex. At the origins of life, simpler solution must have been capable of sustaining self-replication and evolution. And therefore, I believe that building our own molecular building blocks, so to say, can actually be a, a shortcut. But we'll see, you know, all of these approaches are super cool. And in the end, it would be amazing to have not just biology 2.0, but also 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, and so on. So all of this is valid. I like the fact that you took a look at life and said, I can do a better job. You can simplify it. <laughs> <I> can, <laughs> it's very complex. Yeah, I can, I can make, I can be, I can simplify that. That, that's, that's delightfully audacious. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, it's a bit, a little bit similar to, to you know, we came from the Miller-Urey experiment, right? Where um, also you start with very, very simple building blocks. And I, I'm sure at the origins of life, self-replication and evolution have been sustained by a simpler set of building blocks. And, you know, um, one can ask if it's if it's possible to 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 use such uh, to use uh, well to use such building blocks to 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 start not from where life is right now because that took four billion years to get there right but to start actually at a, at a simpler stage. 
essentially, but still have a system capable of evolution. That's really that's really the holy grail, I would say here, because you know it's a part of the fundamental definition of life, and B will help us to to get somewhere interesting. Thank you.